This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Lee Yarrow, an old friend and colleague whom I met some years ago, although I'm not going to say how many years ago, um, shortly after she moved to New York after finishing her PhD at Oxford University. Um, Liev is a professor at the City University of New York, and she splits her responsibilities between the Classics Department at Brooklyn College and Classics and History at the Graduate Center. She is a prolific author and blogger, you should check out her blog, on ancient things, albeit mostly Roman. And among her publications are two books, including her first monograph, Historiography at the End of the Republic, Provincial Perspectives on Roman Rule, which was published in 2006 by Oxford, and a more recent monograph that appeared in the Using Coins as Sources series, there it is, um, uh, that's part of that uh, Cambridge ANS uh, series, and that one is entitled The Republic to 49 BCE, and that appeared in 2020. And uh, many of you might also know her as well from the ANS's ongoing Roman Republican Die Project, which she co-directs with Dr. Lucia Carbone, our Andrew Burnett Associate Curator of Roman Coins. And today, Professor Yarrow will be discussing a rather weighty topic, um, heavy bronze, preliminary results of a metallurgical analysis. So leave, it's all yours. Oh, thank you so much. It was a really kind introduction. I don't like to think about how long I've known you either. It feels <laughs> like just yesterday I became acquainted with the with ANS. So this is very much a work in progress, but I'm told that that is okay. The first thing I want to do is introduce my co-researcher to you, Wayne Powell. He's um, not a numismatist, and he's not with us today because he's up doing sciencey things with big machines in a lab at Yale. And I hear that it's very hard to get access to these uh, this laboratory time. Um, uh, let me go forward. Just to give you a sense of his work, he's collaborated a great deal with colleagues in both the Balkans and Turkey, primarily in the Balkans and Serbia. He's an expert on tin isotopes, uh, particularly in Bronze Age artifacts. His most recent publication is of the Ulubrun shipwreck with its tin ingots. Um, and he and the um, a great team of scholars have recently proven that the majority of that tin, about two thirds of it, comes from Anatolian sources, um, as well as being mixed with larger trade routes. Um, so I'm, we've known each other for years, we've taught together at, in general education courses, um, and he's long encouraged me to draw on his um, bronze expertise to say something about uh, um, the artifacts that interest me. So I've started to take him up on the challenge of sticking my toe into these waters. So the main question that I'm trying to get at is some better, deeper understanding of what's going on with the what we would call the Burnett hypothesis. Burnett put it perhaps simply an idea that many people have had that when the Romans first make bronze coinage, these really heavy eye scrub. Um, they're taking the form and maybe the function of silver coins that they're deeply familiar with from their su uh, um, southern um, neighbors in Magna Gratia, and they're combining it with a another familiar form of money, the eyes rood, that is found throughout central Italy, um, uh, uh, northern parts as well, and then all the way over um, into the Balkan Peninsula, um, these uh, chunks of what's often called um, bronze bullion. How do these two things marry together in the Roman mind? Why are the Romans sort of the first to do, do this? How does it develop? What does it say about how they thought about money and coins in the third century? Um, my own work on this, uh, you will have the ability to read my sort of my ER paper, 
just next month when Making of the Middle Republic comes out from Cambridge University Press along with this chapter called The Strangeness of Rome's Early Heavy Bronze Coinage. What I did for that paper is I reinvestigated all of the known weights based both on Crow and Haberlin's data for the earliest I scrub. So that's 14, 18, and 19. Not that there's many samples of 19 to do any real meaningful work um, on it. The biggest outcomes of that study is that there's very little concern to control the weights of these early um, objects and that the smallest denominations are grossly overweight, i.e. that they should, if they were traded as bullion, be worth far more than the larger denom uh, denominations. Um, it also revealed that in no statistically meaningful way can we say that RC18 um, is heavier than RC14. Um, one of the things that's happened is because um, Rudy Thompson thought 14 was heavier, sorry, 18 was heavier than 14. That's why he put them in those order. And um, Crawford followed Thompson on that. So the chronological order is based on the weight standards. And so once we undermine what we think we know about the weight standards, our understanding of their relative chronology also um, has to be challenged and reinvestigated. So um, <clears throat> from this paper, the next question is, is to continue thinking about the fabric of these um, objects. Perhaps the strangest thing though, is that they leap forth fully formed like a Athena from the head of Zeus. It's a base 12, hugely complex denomination system. There are no immediate parallels in South Italian coinage for this complex of a denomination system or for this complex of a series of denomination markers. There are a few Sicilian precedents, but they're hundreds of years earlier. It looks from the outside like Rome might be reinventing a denomination system. And the importance of it is clearly indicated, oh, come on. There, okay, um, is clearly indicated by the denomination markers themselves. And one of the things I want you to appreciate is that a denomination system is, is in some ways the exact opposite of a bullion system based on weight. The coin talks to us, it tells us what it's worth, um, uh, and it communicates that the issuing authority, we assume the Roman state, though they don't say Rome on them, um, expects the receiver of these coins to accept that face value as marked without questioning it. So without weighing it, it shouldn't, it should negate the need to weigh the coins, which as my previous study showed, is problematic given the fact that they're not tightly controlling for weight. It looks like they have to be spent, that coins of vastly different weights have to be circulating together. So for this paper um, today, I'm looking at three questions and I'm gonna spend most of my time on methodology. So before we get to the questions themselves, and then the first two questions. Um, but, you know, I don't want to leave you in suspense. So we'll just go ahead and suggest some answers to these questions. Is there a consistent bronze recipe, i.e. a ratio of main elements across the issues and within issues? Yeah, there does. And I didn't expect that at all. I was expecting much more variation. Is it similar to other known objects, eyes, rude, and Rome currency bars? Um, no, for the eyes, rude, maybe for the Roman currency bars, but even there, we've got, um, it raises some methodological questions of how we compare our data. Um, and then finally, does eyes, uh, Roman eyes graph have meaningful intrinsic value? Um, what I'm going to say is the type of variation and the nature of the alloy makes it very hard to consider 
eyes grab valuable in any intrinsic way, even though it seems to have been valued as money. Um, and that is challenging to our standard logic about why the bronze is so heavy um, at this early date and how we think about even preceding monetary forms. Um, and what I would also say that I'm not convinced I'm right about these answers yet. We're still in process, but this is where we're trending. So what have I done? I took 281 um, PXRF readings from three different collections. Those collections were Rutgers, Princeton, and Yale. You can see Princeton's collection was the most important from this study. Um, of all of those readings, I only kept in 146. That means I threw out nearly 50% of the data I collected. And those readings are based on only 75 specimens. So what am I about to show you is my collected evidence from 75 specimens from three collections. Our current testing protocols, um, and these will be refined as we get better at doing testing, involve taking a minimum of two readings from each specimen. Initial readings are taken from the center of the large flat sides. If the readings suggest chemical change, additional elements, or modern fabrication, um, I take further readings on available surface, noting location in my um, report in relation to the design and other features. To, um, so I always have a note about where the reading came from on the specimen, if it's not from the center. If the highest point or most obvious where point doesn't correspond with the center, usually it does, usually that's the highest point. And so it's rubbed um, somewhat cleaner than the rest of the surface. Um, I retest those visibly worn spots as well. Um, priority of analyses, all of this is saying the same thing. Priority of analyses is on area that's free of visual evidence of patina and incrustation. So I just told you I threw out half my data. Why did I do that? Or nearly half my data. Um, so that's not random. It's not just my gut instinct. I had a method. Uh, the first thing, the thing I threw out was zinc. Why? Uh, zinc in the third century BC is not able, the Romans were not technically able to make um, brass. Brass is a product of the first century BC in the Roman world. Any high degree of brass, um, really anything over trace amounts. Um, so I'd say 1%. Um, but even, you know, some people say 3%, but there's really no ability to create a brass type alloy in this period, um, such that we can assume uh, zinc indicates that it is modern manufacture. Next element that gets a piece tossed is barium. A barium is used as an otter artificial modern patina, particularly in the early 20th century to make these things more beautiful. Um, but it does interfere with our readings. So out go the barium samples. And some of my, the ones I tested were upwards of 10% barium in the readings. So a pretty heavy dose of barium on there. Light elements. So light elements are indicating that there's been an oxidative um, alteration to the sur surface. So there's been copper lo loss and that a tin oxide has accumulated on the surface. That means that the, the surface level is not reflect, has been chemically changed such that it's not useful. This is the biggest problem with specimens and, the, and would be the main reason to do intrusive testing. Um, second only to light elements is incrustation. That is, they reflect the conditions of deposition, where it spent the centuries before it reached the collection. And the most common elements that we find are silicone, um, calcium, sulfur, and chloride. Um, chloride is very corrosive to um, bronze and destroys objects. Um, and 
a side effect of this testing is I'm able to flag objects that need um, urgent conservation to um, arrest um, any um, negative effects of chloride. Suspected human error. This is, these three museum visits have been my training ground to make me better at doing this work. I take notes as I test each specimen. I also take photographs of every specimen as um, I test it. Um, and if, when I get to the end of the day back at home, I try and match up my notes with the photos and it doesn't seem to make any sense, I throw out those too, because I want to make sure that everything's right. And I assume my systems will get better as I go on. One or two, there were um, specimens had significant data outliers where I, um, for multiple reasons, thought they were probably modern imitations and chose not to proceed with including them in my data set. Um, Part of that is the lack of typical trace elements where the main elements within the readings look fine, but it's missing. It looks as if say the copper was far too refined for the period um, and that sort of data. So what are my next steps? The next steps I'm including at this point rather at the end because I want you to see more about my methodology and not believe that I'm 100% confident that the protocols I've laid out are getting me accurate results. So what the most important step to my mind is to stop testing unprovenanced specimens, even if they're in old good collections. Um, I don't know for certain that they're ancient or where they came from. Um, I've identified the NEMI material that's from the Sanctuary of Diana Nemerensis um, that's in the Alban Hills right outside of Rome. Um, it was excavated um, by Lord Saville in the 1890s. Uh, he took nearly all of the coins. Some others were sold um, on the market. There's a good catalog produced by Crawford with the help of Burnett um, published in the 80s. And the lovely people uh, in Nottingham have agreed to let me come and test their material. One of the reasons I like the NEMI specimens is that instead of being a hoard with a single deposition date, they have the whole run of the Republican series in bronze as votive deposits. And we can then both be confident that they come from an archeological site, but also we can have a wide time span to see if there's any chronological um, change or notation. Also, they all have the same conditions of deposition, which means their surface, um, any sort of environmental factors should be evened out uh, by looking at the NEMI specimens. We want to identify ideal specimens for in, um, internal sampling that is drilling to contextualize surface readings and conduct SEM and isotope analyses on those drilling. But before we drill, um, we are planning experimental archeology. span So we have some hypotheses about the recipe of the original bronze structure. And we wish to try out a variety of casting techniques because the way in which you um, smelt the metals and pour them into the, uh, the material and then how they cool all can affect how the surface metal of the object um, interacts. So um, those sample ones where we know the original condition, the conditions of manufacture, we will then drill, slice, break, um, visualize, um, and understand better what, um, whether or not um, what the results might look like. I'm also deeply curious about um, the spew data. So you may, if you've held a lot of these things, known that uh, most of them has, have one visible channel where the metal was poured into the mold, some have two. Um, I've been collecting, counting spews 
And I think that that should allow us to say something about how long the chain molding, um, the chains were in the chain molding manufacture process. Um, and given that the manufacture process of pouring the metal through the channels is also going to affect cooling rates um, and possibly the nature of the spec, um, the metallurgy of the individual specimens. Um, finally, while I've been doing this work in collections, I'm also taking re um, readings of Italian Iskrav coins. The Italian Iskrav is not as numerous as the Roman. It's also all later than the first issues of Rome of Roman and it comes from diverse locations. So it's not nearly as easy to say anything meaningful about ice about ice grab. Now at this point you're like, um, but I don't want you to drill coins because uh, that's destructive. And I don't really believe your XRF because I've been told that for silver it's um it's been shown to be junk science. Yes and no. So both techniques are necessary and to a certain degree useful. One of the main problems is that unlike for silver and gold, drilling is not going to give us an answer that we want. Um, and that has been well known in the field for quite some time. Lead has, uh, has substantially no solid solubility in copper and copper-based alloys. If the percentage of lead in bronze is higher than a few percent, lead occurs as a dispersion of fine particles throughout the bronze. Um, that means that if I take a drilled a core sample of, of a, the bronze of one of these ice grub, I'm still only getting some, some um, some small amount of the overall composition of all of the elements. Um, and so, the, um, so to try and avoid multiple drillings, the better we can get at surface analysis to compare to drilled results, we may get somewhere closer to the original um, recipe. So as I'm taking these readings, because of um, the factors we just talked about, there are differences between the readings of individual specimens. So obverse reading and reverse reading may differ. And so I quantified that degree of difference. And you can see that there are some significant outliers, um, but that in terms of relative standard deviation um, here, uh, there is least for tin and most for copper and lead, the differences between the two states. Um, I've not excluded for this study these outliers, and I've been encouraged to continue to leave them in until I have a, a fixed reason, because they may be saying something about the nature of the alloy, and I don't want to um, exclude them too soon from the study. So now that you know what I've been up to, we're ready to dive into our questions. Up first is, is there a consistent bronze recipe, um, a ratio of main elements, and is it consistent across issues and within issues? Um, our initial results say yes. It looks like it's a base 12 recipe, and it is fairly close from PXRF testing to a 732 ratio. That means um, there are seven parts of copper to two parts tin to three parts lead on average across the specimens. Another way of looking at this is at this um, this triplot graph. You can see how they're all um, all 146 readings are clustering around that 432 point here. It becomes a midpoint of it. And there are very few within this tripod um, 
significant outliers, that there's a real density cluster um, in this sector of, um, of the graph, which suggests consistency. Um, you may notice that I've grouped together um, iron, uh, um, arsenic, and antimony with um, copper, and that's because those elements, although trace and minute, tend to come in through um, those alloys or re-smelting of earlier bronzes. Uh, so they make up the total of what the person creating the alloy thought was copper because no, they're not intentionally adding in these elements. They just travel along with, uh, uh, with the copper. Similarly, um, the silver, which can get fairly high to a couple percentage points in a few specimens, is coming in with the lead, and it's because the lead is not terribly refined. I also drew the same picture removing trace elements, and it looked nearly identical. So we're not seeing massive shifts there. So even if they cluster around a point, there's still a lot of noise in the data. We've seen that from readings from the same specimen, that that is probably best explained by the lack of lead solubility in copper um, in the nature of the alloy. Um, but differences between specimens might be accounted for in the smelting process. And that's why we're so interested in experimental archeology span here. Um, the data conforms remarkably well to one of the phase boundaries in copper, um, in a copper lead tin system with the majority of artifacts fitting into a field where the molten metal will separate into two liquids, one copper rich and one um, lead rich. So that means that as you're pouring out, as you get lower into your molten crucible, you're going to be getting a different ratio of molten material based on how much you've melted at one time and how you're pouring it into your mold. Even so, if we break it down by issue, because of course that was my first thought on noise, all of the issues in the numbers and parentheses down here at the bottom tell you how many specimens of each issue I tested. Um, I did not break it down by denomination, but I think in any final um, publication, we would also um, check the different denominations. They all look pretty um, consistent um, and not so different than the all together. I will, however, say that I just don't trust the variation I see in the four specimens of RC41. Um, I would need far more. And I think in any published version of this study, I may stop before the Prow series, uh, at least in the initial instance. Uh, the work of others have shown that there's big changes in the Second Punic War um, with the uh, so supplies of bronze and we can assume with their manufacture. Um, the only outlier, if you can even call it that, would be the sickle series, which seems to have substantially less copper than the other issues. Um, I know that Seth Bernard, for other reasons, has been in interested in the sickle series as behaving differently and looking differently than other early Roman Republican coin series. So I'm just gonna say, watch this space. I think there's something going on with the sickle series, but it's going to take um, some collaborative work to figure, figure it out. Um, the other point, um, because of course it could just be, we're talking small numbers of samples at this point, it could just be variation, is that when we look at the relative standard devi deviations where the higher these bars, the more data variation there is, and the lower, the more commonality there is in readings. You can see that in all series, um, copper 
is fairly tri tightly controlled compared to other metals. And that um, and that copper here is in blue. And you can also see that with a sickle series, even with eight specimens, which is not that far off, we're seeing far less variation so that they're, they may be more tightly controlling it, how they're creating this impure issue. Or there could be a shift in manufacture procedures for this issue. As I was just hinting at, um, if we try and um, quantify how much variation, we can say that in terms of their relative standard deviation and visually, we can see it with a Pareto gap, that copper is the least variable element in any of these objects. So it looks like it's the thing they care most about, about that they care perhaps as much as um, two times as much about the copper content than to the lead, um, um, than the lead and uh, tin. The um, there are no known specimens with below thirty three percent copper, um, and even below forty percent is really rare. Um, and but it's even rarer to have specimens that get much over seventy five percent. Um, copper. So moving on, this picture that I've presented to you of the composition, is it similar or different to Eisrud and currency bars? It is very different from Eisrud. Um, to get data on Eisrud, I'm building on the work of Baldassare, who has excavated at Giacchioforte, which is a site um, north of Rome. It closes very abruptly with an act of violence in about 280, which is the coming of the Romans. Um, so we know that all of the numerous pieces of ice rude found on this site um, were there in 280 BC. Um, and they look, the archaeologists tell us, look like they are being used like local monetary objects in um, significant uh, quantities. And the most interesting thing about Baldessari's work is that she's shown, um, again, using a PXRF um, uh, technologies, that there are huge variations in the worth of the individual pieces or the, not the worth, the, um, the content, the metal content of the individual pieces of ice root. So just because it looks to us like ice root, some of them are one copper to 2% lead or 50, 50. Some of them, uh, some of them very few are pure copper. We also have ones that are in a one to four ratio of tin to copper plus lead. And then we have ones that are extremely iron rich and we have other combinations. There doesn't look like there's any recipe for ice rude and for ice rude that is circulating together and acting as common monetary objects for a whole group of individuals in a settlement that are close neighbors to Rome at the beginning of the third century BC. And this is confirmed by some of the te uh, testing by De Caro on materials um, from, um, that have been excavated uh, as a hoard on Sardinia. So uh, we're seeing similar high degrees of variation. Oh, went back instead of forward. Now, what about drilling? The BM drilled their currency bars um, in the mid 80s. Part of the reason for drilling was because of this Spear Amphora Roman currency bar. They had acquired it in the 70s um, and there was some concern along with a bar they acquired at the same time, a bull bull bar, about whether they might be genuine. Um, and uh, Crawford had asserted that 
the spear M4 a type was a modern forgery, all of them, that it didn't exist as an ancient type. Um, and in response to that, Burnett, Craddock, and Meeks drilled a whole series of bars to um, see if the spear amphora and the new bull bar um, map fit the pattern. And they did. They look genuine and they look genuine to my eyes. And I wouldn't question those um, acquisitions in any way. Um, the, um, and again, uh, copper is most tightly controlled about a two to one with the um, with lead and tin in the variation. So if the bars and the drilling is accurate and we can trust the drilling um, because I've already raised concerns about why drilling might not produce good results. It looks like Roman currency bars fit far better an eight to three to one ratio than a um, a seven uh, than a seven th um, a two to three ratio, um, and I don't know what to make of that. This is where I got up into February, and then really very kindly, um, Fleur Kemmers with her colleagues Western and Klein shared some of their raw data. They drilled a great deal of bronze. Um, to try and work with lead isotopes to talk about the sources of the raw materials um, before and after the Second Punic War. That was published in 2020, the summary of their data. But I was really just interested in the cast materials. Um, they drilled eight specimens at Munster, and these are the types that they drilled. So you can see there's very few of the types that, um, or the, the issues that have more than one specimen drilled and there's none of the sickle. Um, but if we take it in mass, these numbers look very similar to the drilling done at the British Museum. Um, and their relative, um, uh, their relative standard deviations um, makes it look um, that, copper and tin are tightly controlled, but, um, but lead is not. How are their testing methods similar or different than the BM ones? They were much more keenly aware that um, lead isn't dissolvable in, um, in copper in high percentages. And so what they did is instead of drilling every specimen once, they drilled it three times from three different locations on the eye scrub. And then they mixed those three samples together to take a sort of a, a collection. So three points of samples. And they didn't test those individual samples separately, but they only tested them all mixed together. Um, I have not thought hard enough about what is going on there, but I absolutely um, want to. And it gives me pause. Um, we don't yet know because we haven't tested these objects or the Roman currency bars with PXRF, what accounts for the variation, which is part of our interest in experimental archeology span is to test our methods where we know what's inside because we put it there and then do the drilling um, and the um, PXRF on the samples to see if we can replicate results and come up with a procedure that is um, scientifically defensible for the testing of these objects. And we're just not there yet. So I promised in my announcement of this um, a fun, use of metrology to re-authenticate a piece. So I am going to skip ahead here. Uh, somehow my slides got out of order and show you the Blitz bar. I published this in um, 2020 uh, in the Journal of Ancient um, Numismatics. Um, and 
the photo here is thanks to Andrew McCabe. And the reason he had a photo of the bar um, is because it was part of the BM handling collection. It didn't have any accession number. And according to the BM coin room, it's, it was an electrotype of an original bar that could be used for handling. Some of you may be aware that in World War II, um, during the Blitz, the coin department was evacuated. I, they put into deep storage all the most valuable coins, but they didn't remove from the BM the eye scrav because, well, it's really, really heavy. And the coin department of the British Museum was bombed and exploded and including this bar. And so this bar was recovered from the wreckage and its recovery from the wreckage meant that its original history was lost and it was filed as an electrotype in the handling collection. I matched it on a number of points to a watercolor by James Byers from 1778. And the watercolor luckily comes with a letter explaining the contents of a hoard that was discovered in um, Tuscany in autumn of that year. And while I couldn't know for sure that it was the same bar and not an electrotype of the bar, of the original that was now lost or dispersed, there seemed to me to be no doubt that there was a relationship. So I'm just going to show you, like there's a little dot hole here, there's this little hole here. There's multiple visual points of comparison. Um, given the um, visual similarity, the BM agreed to do metallurgical testing and the Blitz bar turns out by, their, by the BM Scientific Lab to have a very similar composition to all of the others. And so it has now been reaccessioned in the BM. But at the same time, they were kind enough to also test, um, again, using XRF, um, the, uh, some of their 14 and 18 issues. And so on this one, um, it's almost hard to see because they overlap so perfectly. These peaks represent um, the, uh, the, both the quantity and the character of each element within it. And you can see they're labeled. So this big one here is copper. Um, if you can almost make out the green shadows here, um, the green, is the bar. And so what is remarkable is the degree to which the green and the red line up almost so you can't see them, they blot each other out. And that's um, overlaying the metallurgical profile of uh, an RRC-14 with the Blitz bar, suggesting a high degree of similarity between the nature of the metal, which supports some of my um, suspicions that they may have been issued at very similar times um, and perhaps served similar functions in the Roman world. Finally, um, it's reauthenticated both, and now when you search for it, it comes up with its friend, the watercolor in their collection database, which makes me very happy. So do, did the Roman eyes graf have meaningful intrinsic value? You can't say that when you pick up a piece of eyes graf that you know how much copper is likely to be in it or how much tin or how much lead. It's not visibly obvious and it's not deducible by its weight itself. Yes, those metals still have value, but how that value would have been assessed by those who use them is unclear. So I would just say at this point, the conversation is to be continued and I hope I have more knowledge to share with you at some future time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liev. Um, in fact, you know, it's rather interesting to, to think about the same 
problem that we have with uh, early electrum, um, where there is a great deal of variability in the alloy mixture in some series, and therefore, you know, the question of how it, you know, intrinsic value, as it, uh, you know, is often said, um, corresponds then to whatever the transactional value of that object might have been. So, you know, some similar problems at, uh, you know, other opposite ends, you know, as it were, of the Mediterranean there. So, uh, do, do we have any uh, questions? I'm sure there must be for for Leave. Peter, may, may I ask a question about the intrinsic value? Uh, yeah, go, sure. go right ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. Uh, I, one of the things that that uh, I'm curious about, because I study something in somewhat parallel, same time period, but across the pond, which is the Ptolemaic coinage, some of which is also very large bronze coins around that same time. Yes, absolutely. And I, I wonder about the, the intrinsic question, why, if in, in the Roman case, the, coin, the, the coins are marked for, for, for value. They have pellet, pellet counts and so on. In the Ptolemaic case, they're not. But in the Roman case, it, the elephant in the room is, someone went to an enormous expense to make million, Th hundreds of thousands or millions of coins that weigh hundreds of grams. They expended millions of kilograms of bronze. And the, uh, the question is, if they're marked, why make coins that are twice as valuable, twice as heavy, if they're not intrinsically valued for the bronze itself? Yeah. Um, the best answer I have yet is cultural expectations. The the cult, the very strong ice rude culture within central Italy um, means that, and we know through hoarding patterns, and I'm sorry, I didn't put a slide in or get into hoarding at all, that these, the earliest ice, um, ice grab travel with ice rude and um, in deposition contexts, um, and that they're seeking to make an object that will be valued and perceived as money by the people who they want to value it. Then they intended it to be valued for the amount of bronze that was there. Uh, they expected it to be valued as its denomination. Because the ice root is also not a fixed amount of copper. When you got a heavy piece of ice root, you didn't know what you were getting. Until you took it and smelted it down, you had no idea what what it was worth. Were did anyone actually care about? Yeah, that's the thing. I don't think they tin? did. I think they just had. Copper I think it tin? was money. <laughs> did they did they have pure copper or tin that they traded, or was um, it all just bronze anyway? So there are clear. There is clearly an an ability to refine it to a high degree of purity and within some ice rude deposits, there are nuggets that are pure copper. Um, the real difference, if we wanna work on much bigger time scales is between the Iron Age and the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, and this is the perspective that I'm really grateful that Wayne brings to me, um, tin and the ability to make bronze in a fixed ratio with copper are both extremely valuable. And so they're extremely tightly controlled and the purity of the ingots matters a great deal. I would say that by the time that we're into this historical period of the fourth, third century BC, mostly the third century BC, um, there is a habit of valuing these objects, but the copper and tin are just not valuable in the same way they were before we um, before the Iron Age. And there isn't the, and there's an abundance of those materials both left over from the Bronze Age um, as the bronze weapons and ut and other objects are just not valued in the way that iron objects are now valued practically. Thank you. I'll look forward to find out more about uh, what you have have learned about the quantitative relationships among the denominations 
and so on. Thank you so yeah. much. And I would say also that I don't think I have all of the answers yet. I think I'm really at the beginning of an investigation and I want to refine my methodologies. So, um, I, and uh, I, I remain open to um, work that um, challenge and evidence that challenges my pre presuppositions. I thought we'd find far more variation between the individual specimens than we actually than I have found. Uh, Leave. There's a question from Don Squires in the chat. Does bronze oh, used for armor contain lead? Is the question. No. So the thing is that once you put in anything over a couple of percentages the quality of it becomes just terrible so um one two three maybe even up to four percent lead gives you much more increased viscosity and in casting so it makes it useful for say making a bronze statue where you want it to fill every bit of the mold and you're not worried about remake making it but lead makes the ability to work at a forge, any object, a knife, your, um, uh, uh, your breastplate, your greaves, they become extremely um, friable and nearly worthless. Um, and so the, to, to recover the copper and tin for a useful bronze that was flexible in its application, you would have to take these objects and put in quite a bit of work to get the lead back out or down to a level where it was functional. Get the lead out, right. Get the lead out. <laughs> uh, Kenneth Friedman, uh, see that you've got your hand raised. Thank you. Um, I'm curious as to what percentage of the samples that you looked at um, um, did you believed to be modern forgeries. <clears throat> you know, you indicated there were several factors for deleting them from your, yeah. from your database. Uh, I'd say how many pretty of those high were. and the curators weren't happy. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when they were very pretty samples that were on display. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, another... um, <laughs> I, I'm going to say that yeah, I um, but but I would say that this is also something that I find really historically interesting as a phenomena. So there are a whole class of really bad forageries that were sold as objects leave it, um, to tourists coming back to the United States um, from grand tourist trips. Um, on ships in the 19th century. And I've found that they were particular, they have a habit of ending up in university collections to educate the young men. And they have fake Etruscan inscriptions and none of you would ever think these things were real. Um, and I found ones that match in my local college Lafayette and in University of Michigan. Um, and so there's clearly a 19, and they even come with letters about how they were sold and how they were acquired and the experience. And they're kind of charming in their own, in their own way. Um, a great deal of the fakes that were illustrated by Haberlin in 1910 um, are now in the black box collection of Glasgow. And they're very fine. My working theory is that they, um, were carved and made to be extra beautiful based on drawings of plates um, and drawings and plates done of collections in Italy. Um, and they, they've um, oxidized in strange ways. Um, Heberlin knew they were to be fakes. Um, but I think some of the historic fakes workshops we'll probably be able to identify um, through metallurgical testing. And in and of themselves, I find that sort of an, a valuable and interesting historical question of how um, from the time of buyers in the 1770s, when these objects weren't known really at all, how there's this incredible growth in excitement about um, heavy bronze coming out of Italy and the nature of how they were sold and marketed. So I'm also really interested in at least the 19th century fakes. <laughs> 
Good. Um, we've got a couple of other questions now in the chat. Uh, Jean Kirsten is asking, do you consider Oldian and Italian cast bronze coins related? Do I consider? Oldian and Italian cast bronze coins to be related. I don't, um, but it would be a natural next step if I trust my me methodologies to look for um, difference and similarity. Do you know what I'm really hoping is that we come up with a testing protocol that um, we're fairly confident in our results and I'm not there yet. Um, but once we have that, I will be much more interested in seeing how widely we can apply it. Uh, also in the chat, uh, Stephen Nagler is asking, have you considered characterizing some of the specimens using methods that average over the entire bulk of the material, for example, neutrons? Um, <laughs> yes. So one of the questions is how do we get the things to a lab if the technology isn't portable? Um, and how particularly do we get objects that we are confident that are worthy of testing, which to me means ones that I can trace back to very specific archeological um, contexts. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, um, I'm definitely interested. I would say that I think in all of these regards, we may find that some of our most eager and flexible uh, testing partners are going to be um, in uh, the Northern Balkans because we know from like the um, Mazen horde, uh, this material does travel across the Adriatic. Um, and Wayne already has pre-existing um, relationships with uh, major museums from <coughs> earlier tin, um, tin isotope research. Um, I'll, I'll just comment that you can get access to the facilities at NIST or Oak Ridge by writing a peer review proposal. Cool. Right, well, 75% of the time is open. And if you're publishing the data, there's no charge for that. That but is you do have to pass fantastic. peer review. Yes. And, no, and I if just anything, if, right, if you're doing, you know, sort of artificially constructive samples and want to get a very detailed look at those, you know, that, that would be a good method of doing it as a complement to your other X-ray fluorescence and whatnot. Right. Thank you so much. Um, would you um, mind uh, dropping me an email or perhaps Emma can put us in touch so I can follow up on the details of that. I'm very interested in knowing more. Sure. Yeah, I am too, actually. So, uh, Gilles, I see you've got your hand raised. Yeah. No, I'd like to make one comment and ask one question. Um, so the comment, yes, we, we hear that the metallic composition is not stable. So there is no stable community value between the different pieces uh, of uh, uh, as gravity we're talking about. I mean, th this said, obviously, even if the commodity value is unstable, there is a commodity value. Copper is a relatively expensive metal. These pieces are heavy. Um, you know, up to the 4th, 5th and 6th century, you still have um, imperial decision and edict that explicitly mention the value of bronze to gold. So having pieces of, you know, with 100 or 150 gram of copper is not inconsequential. But that's not my question. How do you relate that system to the, that time, um, uncontroversially fiduciary system that the Roman operated at the same time, which is the Litra system? Yes, the um, RC, um, 16 and 17 are real mysteries. Um, and I think it's why, why I put such an emphasis on, um, on communities of circulation, who wants to be paid how. Um, and if you want someone to accept your money, you better pay them in a form of money that they recognize and accept. Um, I will be very interested to run some of these tests on our C6, uh, um, 16 and 17 as well. 
Um, they are, there are a few, not nearly as much as the ice grav in the NEMI deposit. So that will provide some opportunity, but I would, you know, I would also, um, I would also say that this is where I'm really excited to um, see how Seth Bernard as an economic historian thinks about these matters, because um, going back to the sickle series, mm. I think what he's, one of the things he's, he's hinting at or um, that we're working towards, particularly with my, my data and his, is that it might be that the sickle series is where they're starting to wrestle with how do we bring everything into um, a system? How do we make it make sense from our, the, the state's point of view? Um, because obviously making those litres is way cheaper for them than yeah. but, you know, massive uh, amount of energy to, to make yeah. these huge things. Actually, I had a conversation with Seth when we were uh, together in Rome last, yep. uh, last month. Um, and the, the key question we, where we have no answer, but if is a question of a convertibility. Do mm. you have unlimited convertibility of the light uh, bronze um, uh, copper into silver? Because if yes, silver did circulate and you would have an opportunity to move your silver around and exchange it against much heavier valuable pieces at whatever exchange rate was or prevailed at that time. So the question of, of convertibility I mean, as you know, in modern Europe, um, there was a cap on convertibility between base coinage and precious metal coinage. I'm not yeah. aware of any cap in convertibility in the ancient world. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I will say that I am really interested in some, uh, some answers. And if you have su some suggestions on methodologies and how to get at it, I, I'm all ears. <laughs> Um, a few more questions now in the chat, um, even though we're at the top of the hour, we can run through them. Um, Daniel Wolf is asking, does NAA testing, neutron activation analysis testing, leave the specimen radioactive? Sure does, for a little bit yeah. anyway. Um, we, we at the ANS had some early electrum coins tested using NAA, and they were quarantined, I think, for about six months or something, so... And that's um, a very much smaller object than one of these massive things. Yeah. Uh, Jean is asking again, uh, do you check your data against specific gravity? Um, I have not. So um, the a good setup for specific gravity uh, um, is it's simple, but needs precisely calibrated scales. I'll say that in the Princeton coin room, uh, they didn't even have a scale that went over 150 grams. <sighs> so I couldn't even check the weights on the heaviest of these specimens. Yeah, in fact, some of those um, scales- you Let alone go point. into specific gravity or with, with any degree of um, accuracy. Yeah. I tested specific gravity on electrum to convince uh -huh. myself it was really electrum and not silver. And, you know, I can do that. I would think lead and copper would have a significant difference. Yep. Uh, yeah. Enough that you could see 20 or 30%. Mm -hmm. uh, Fabrizio is asking, a lot of early cast Roman and Italian coins have been found in sanctuaries and votive deposits. Do you think this could have a relationship slash explanation to the nature of this particular series and especially have to do with their heavy weight? Yeah, so the sacred quality is something that has, the potential sacred quality is something that has been um, considered. Um, I, I'm going to say that yes, religion, tends to be somewhat conservative um in but i don't think that the pieces are made for um a votive or strictly sacred um context our best evidence um is the publication by yaya and molinare of the um 
the first Punic War site on the coast of Latium where the roof collapsed um, due to fire. Uh, it looks like a violent, um, uh, a violent collapse um, of the site. And there are a scatter horde of coins under the destruction layer. Um, and we can see that I scrub and fragments of um, Roman currency bars circulate with regular coins in regular karmars um, from that site. And if we had more good archaeological provenance of the third century excavations, I think we would find more cases. And so I think we're more likely to find nice coins intact in sanctuaries um, than from their um, everyday use. But I can point to that one publication to say these things were everyday money as well. Very good. And uh, Mike Beal is asking, how does the shrinking at the end of the third century jibe with the idea that the coins didn't coincide with their weight? Um, so, uh, so the, um, Emma, could you just, I'm seeing some, ch some private chats are also coming in. Could you save me a copy of the chat before you close this session out? So I, I have it all. I don't want to ignore anyone or, um, not get, get to everything. Um, on the weight reduction, I, um, it was a war. They had a shortage of materials. Um, they reduced um, how much they were using. They were economizing already by including so much lead it, to make heavy coins um, and saving on the copper. And it made sense to continue those reductions. Um, and Warren just has a comment saying uh, that specific gravity works better for alloys of only two metals, with three metals that can't give a particular result for each component. That's great. I have not read enough about it, but I will continue to learn. Can um, I ask there... a question? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, do we know the relative values of uh, copper, tin, and lead in the third century? I don't think... Um, we um, we believe that lead is the least expensive of the materials, um, but no, I don't think we have good epigraphic evidence to back that up. Okay, we'll At leave. My... Not that I know of yet. Okay, that makes me just make a suggestion. Uh, is it possible that the rel the relative amounts of the three metals? was just due to uh, metallurgical ease in making the coins. And mm -hmm. uh, the Romans may have thought they were all of fairly equal value. And so they just uh, uh, attacked the problem uh, metall metallurgically. Yeah. And uh, Gilles just writing in the chat that there is an attic inscription with copper and tin values, but not lead. Excellent. What, what century is that, Gilles? Oh, you're... you're uh... Um, I need to check. I think it's late fourth uh, century. Right. Perfect. Yeah, seems... Pl Pliny provides some prices, but the price for lead is obviously corrupted. Uh, if you believe Pliny, lead is more expensive than copper or even silver. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I worry about trusting Pliny. <laughs> <laughs> and things. why is that? No, 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 no. no. We're, we're not going to go there. So. Um, Thank you again, Leave. That that was wonderful. Uh, very informative. Very interesting. Um, I'm really grateful for all this great feedback and the ideas. And you know, as I said, don't believe me yet. Um, let's see how this develops. <laughs> yeah. Well, very much looking forward to uh, the, the uh, final results, the final publication of all of this.